Good afternoon. Welcome to our program today. I'm Heather Campbell, Curator of Museum Programs for the University Museums, and I'm honored to introduce today's event titled Virtual Gallery Talk, a conversation with Richard Waller, Executive Director of the University of Richmond Museums, and James Stroud, Director of the Center Street Studio. Due to COVID-19 protocols on campus, our galleries are only open to the UR campus community by appointment. So this afternoon, you will be virtually guided through the exhibition, 40 Years of Printmaking from the Center Street Studio Archives. The exhibition opened on January 19th and will be on view through March 26th. The exhibition features prints by contemporary artists that were printed by James Stroud, artist, master printer, and founder and director of the Center Street Studio in Milton, Massachusetts. The Joel and Lila Harnett Print Study Center at the University of Richmond Museums has been acquiring these prints since 1998 as part of the Center Street Studio archives in the Print Study Center's permanent collection. During today's program, we will be using a 360 tour technology for the gallery tour. If you wanted to explore the gallery tour on your own, check it out on our website at museums.richmond.edu. It can be found on the exhibition page. Also, at the end of our tour, we will have a question and answer segment. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions to our presenters. Also, please mark your calendars for our next program on Wednesday, March 10th at 11 a.m. We will be presenting another virtual program with James Stroud, and he will be conducting a printmaking demonstration and having a conversation with artist Jeff Perrot. Please refer to our website calendar for registration information. It will be available next week. I will now turn the program over to Richard Waller, Executive Director of the University of Richmond Museums. Welcome to our virtual gallery talk and tour of the exhibition, 40 Years of Printmaking from the Center Street Studio Archives, now on view in the Joel and Lila Harnett Museum of Art. Organized by the University of Richmond Museums, the exhibition and programs are made possible in part with funds from the Lewis S. Booth Arts Fund. I am here with James Stroud, and it's my pleasure to introduce him and to join him for a walk through the exhibition. Jim Stroud is an artist, master printer, and publisher who founded Center Street Studio in 1984 after receiving his MFA from Yale University. Before that, he had studied with the renowned printmaker Stanley William Hayter at Atelier 17 in Paris. For the past 37 years, Jim has collaborated on hundreds of print projects in intaglio, woodcut, and monotype techniques with artists of national and international reputation. As Heather mentioned, in 1998, the University Museum started acquiring the studio's archives as the foundation of its contemporary print collection in the Print Study Center. Prints from the Center Street Studio are often included in, in our collection-based exhibitions, tours, and programs. And this is the fourth exhibition we have presented celebrating the studio archives. The artworks and documentation in the archives are utilized as a primary source for both research and exhibition in the muse university museums. As the repository of the studio's ongoing production, the Harnett Print Study Center provides an important resource for faculty, staff, students, scholars, artists, and our greater community. The, this exhibition from the museum's collection focuses on unusual projects ranging from Jim's earliest print as a master printer to several recent prints he has just published. The collaboration between master printer and the artist has been the hallmark of Center Street Studio since its beginnings in 1984. We look forward 
to taking a closer look with Jim at the prints we have on view in this exhibition. Thank you, Richard. Um, I wish I could see you all. This is very strange. I prefer doing these gallery talks, obviously, in the gallery. It's much easier when uh, you see the faces and you see the work right in front of you. But uh, this will have to do. And um, it's pretty cool technology. So I think you'll enjoy it as we all walk through the exhibition together. Um, I've said yeah. this, like, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Here we are. I think uh, we need to get David uh, to show us the entrance to the exhibition. Great. Using, there we using go. 360 de degree view of the installation. David Hershey, our assistant collections manager, will be moving us through the exhibition as Jim discusses uh, the prints that are on view. And uh, Jim, let's start with the prints by Gail Singer. Well, let's do that. But you know, Richard, I, I want to say something real quick. Okay. Um, I, I've said this. I've said this before. But I think it needs to be said again, and I want to thank you specifically and the University of Richmond for the commitment that you've made to acquire the archive, um, not only to preserve the, my life's work, but also the work of the artists that I worked with over the last uh, certain many years, um, and, and how important a resource it is for the university as a whole. So I can't thank you and the university enough for, for that commitment, and uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great relationship over since 1998. Um, and I also want to say, too, that uh, everyone heard that I established the, the workshop Center Street Studio 1984, and all you math wizards out there will realize that uh, that's not 40 years ago, that was actually 37 years ago. The reason why 40 years of printmaking is because I decided to include this group of four prints by uh, Gail Singer, um, who was an American expat artist in Paris who worked, uh, who actually landed in Paris in 1955. And she worked at Atelier 17 with Stanley Wimmy Hader making prints, but she was also a painter. And um, when I went to work with Hader, uh, I, it was through the, um, the, the encouragement of my then professor at college, Jim Munson, who I'm actually hoping is, is listening in on this today, uh, who lives in, uh, outside of Nice. And he encouraged me to work with Hader, and he told me when I got there to, to look up Gail Singer, because she was a powerful painter, a really uh, terrific artist, and one who, um, who liked to make prints. And by the time I got there, uh, Gail was suffering from numerous ailments, and not the least of which not being, uh, not the least of which being multiple sclerosis. So she was really sort of debilitated and really couldn't get down to the workshop, but she painted every day. She struggled really hard. And so I befriended her and would visit her often, and... Um, she, she wanted to make a print, so I offered to help her out doing it by uh, bringing her plates to her studio in the 13th on the small next to uh, the, the, the 14th where the workshop was. And I would sort of schlep the plate back and forth. She would work on it. I would etch it. I'd proof it, bring it back to her. And she would work on it. She'd struggle. And every mark counted for her because her, her movements are really uh, limited. And you can see there, these are four states of the same plate. The first state being the upper left was just a bunch of lines that she scratched through a hard ground. And then the second one was she painted out and we added an aqua tint and etched it. And then we added, I think it was sugar lift and aqua tint for the last forms. And then the last, the last state, the finished state is I, she had me roll this sort of sinister green over the entire thing. And she titled it Congrès des Fous, which is Gathering of Fools. And she told me she was thinking of the current French government when she was, when she was titling it. And um, so this, this was done 40 years ago, it was 1981. And, and I wasn't a master printer then. I, Center Street Studio wasn't even a thought in my mind, but it was the first instance of me being a master printer, unwittingly a master printer, because I was just helping out another artist. And it was a really great and enriching experience for me. Um, she was very kind and gifted me the three states, the state proofs, and then signed over the number one of 25 of the, of the, of the edition that I printed for her after the fact. I believe uh, a nail, uh, 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 Gail, um, I believe she passed away two years after I, I returned to the States in 1981. So this may very well have been her very last print that she made in her career. But it's an important print to me uh, because it, it really, even though unconsciously, it, 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 I, I was, um, you know, here I was making a print with an artist and, and I never, drew, I didn't even know the master printer was when I was doing this. I was just helping out another artist and, and, and that's what led to my uh, career eventually, which is very strange. 
but wonderful at the same time. So, so um, yeah, so there it is. That's where it all, all starts. Decided I wanted to do this an objections and archive, even though it wasn't done under the uh, the auspices of, of Center Street Studio, which came much later. This is a good way to start. So, and yeah, it's a really good way to start. And so yeah. let's move to what what we're calling the first print of Center it is. Studio. So after um, graduating, getting my MFA, um, I, I turned down a full time teaching job to buy this print shop that came available in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is up on uh, Cape Ann, just north of Boston by about 40 minutes. And uh, at the time, uh, a, a, an artist and also recent grad from Yale, but a few years before me, Aaron Fink, uh, his, his career was really taking off in Boston, one of Boston's best known artists at the time. And he actually summered in on Cape Ann at Rockport, which is this, the next town over. And he heard that I was there uh, and, and, and came over and told me, asked me if I would, uh, you know, if I would make prints with him. And at that time, you know, uh, I was just starting out and I needed to do what we call contract work. You know, I would basically hire myself out as sort of a, a hired hand and, uh, as a master printer to help another artist make their image. And he would pay me on an hourly basis. I look back at the invoices in my file of how much I charged to do these things. And I don't know how I made a living, but somehow I did. And the, the, he came to do a large uh, scale project uh, of a series of portrait heads. Um, but before we got started on that, he wanted to sort of get his feet wet again in, in printmaking. And so he, I gave him a small uh, couple of plates and, this is, uh, he, and he started uh, drawing with what's called sugar lift of uh, this little image of a, a, a smoking cigarette, which was a theme in his painting at the time. And uh, it was a quick little thing we did probably in a day, two plates, a black plate and a blue plate, which the blue plate was fit by Aquatint, and uh, we printed it and it was a lovely little print. And so we had me print the edition, but that was sort of the jump start to get involved in this really large scale uh, print project of these portrait heads, which were, um, which was a series of eight heads all pulled from the same plate through a series of states with each state getting addition, which is also in the, in the collection of the archives at, at the Harnett. Um, so that it's important to have that because that really is the first professional print made at Center Street Studio in 1984. That was probably June of 1984 when I first started, when I first set up and got, uh, got going. The reason I have the, the, the one on the, the print on the left, the, the, the color, I think it's a four plate, five color uh, aquatint um, is the first print uh, that I published with Aaron. He was, uh, he, again, I, I talked about a contract work where I was a hired hand and he paid me for my hourly time. Uh, this is the first time I took a, a financial uh, stake in the project and I funded the project myself. That's what the publishing aspect is all about. And we became partners in the project. And um, so uh, he came to me and did all the work on the plates. I processed the plates and I absorbed the costs and uh, then we print the edition and I sell the prints and recoup my costs and then we split proceeds once we recoup the costs. So it was fun. This is a, a, an image, I believe it's 1991, a typical image of these large scale hat paintings that he was doing. Um, this I believe is a portrait of a hat of this, uh, this uh, that, was, that was I think left to him by his grandfather who had recently passed. And, uh, and uh, it's just a, a very, technically complex and wonderful, colorful print that, um, that uh, represents really one of my earliest um, publishing, actually really not the, early, the earliest publishing ones are early, but the earliest publishing uh, activity with Aaron himself. So that's important print. Aaron was an important artist to me because um, he, he came those first few years, he came uh, faithfully almost every month to make a print and paid me and really kept my cash flow going. And he had a dealer in New York at the time was buying the first 10 prints of every edition that uh, he was making. So he'd uh, pay me, he'd go, she'd buy 10 prints. He'd take the next, they take that money and come back the next month and make another print. So those first two years, which are critical in any business, uh, especially in art business, um, were, uh, were, 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 Pretty good. Uh, able to take a go from Aaron, and then also gave freed me up a little bit to to do some publishing work as well, which you'll see later on in the in the exhibition. Okay, but David, let's turn around and move over to my prints on the opposite wall, shall we? It's exciting to be able to move around the installation and 
and yeah, it's pretty amazing. I looked here at the university. So these, um, I was so busy getting um, my own work, I mean, the, the business going, uh, printing and publishing other people's work. I didn't have much time to do my own prints. I was making some paintings and some drawings, but I, I couldn't get too involved in uh, uh, overly technical etchings. I was doing some monotyping, but for the most part, not any etchings. And I was invited, in 1988, I was invited to show again I, uh, at, at the Salon de Mai in Paris by my friend George Ball, who was uh, taught engraving at Atelier 17. I was there back in 80, 81. He invited me in 81 to the Salon de Mai then, and I was the youngest uh, artist to be exhibiting there. Uh, it was held in the L'Espace Pierre Cardin on uh, the, uh, the Champs-Élysées at that time. But this exhibition was going to be held at the Grand Palais and it, it was an exhibition and it's the, the Salon de Mai is the longest continually running salon in Paris. And um, I was going to invite it for the gravure section, the printmaking section, but it also there was painting and sculpture exhibited as well. And so with that, I decided I wanted to embark on this really complicated etching project. These are two geometric abstract prints, images I was working on the time in my drawings and paintings. And I was able to then deliver them, uh, frame them and deliver them myself because I offered George to help hang the gravure section of the exhibition. So I then made a trip out of it. And this was now in 1988. I arrived, I remember on May 3rd, a Tuesday. No, I take that back, May 2nd, a Tuesday. Um, and, and I settled in, I called Stanley William Hader up uh, because it was the first time since 1981 that I'd been back to Paris and I wanted to see him. I invited him to lunch. And he says he can do it on the Thursday. The ex ex exhibition opening was going to be on the Saturday. He was going to be in the exhibition as well at the Salon de Mai. And I get to the workshop on Thursday and I found out that uh, Stanley William Hader passed away on Wednesday night, the night before we were having lunch. And it was actually my birthday, which is very strange. So I didn't get to see him again after that, but it was, uh, it was, an, ex it was an amazing time for me to be back in Paris. And it also gave me the opportunity to attend his funeral, which was, uh, was pretty astounding. There's people from all over Europe came to pay tribute to him. But in any case, I wanted to include these two prints in this, in this uh, exhibition, this fourth exhibition, because they're the first intaglio prints of my own that I did um, after, uh, after graduate school. Let's move on to Nell Blaine. And this is another example of states that are so important for us to have in our collection. Yeah, and yes, and, and, there, and there'll be a lot more. There's a lot more. This is actually really great to have. There are a lot more state proofs and trial proofs, all, which all become part of the exhibition that we're gathering up to, to, to bring down to Richmond soon. So Nell Blaine was a painter from New York who also summered in Gloucester and in, on Cape Ann. She came for the summer and uh, would, would arrive usually in, um, in May and then return to the Upper West Side of New York uh, uh, in November, just before Thanksgiving. And so she heard, she heard that, uh, that a new print shop had opened in town and set, uh, called me up and asked me if I would be willing to work with her. And I was, I, I knew of her work, but Nell had suffered, uh, uh, she actually contracted polio on a painting trip in, in Europe many years prior and uh, was, was handicapped and was, was, um, uh, she, was, she, she was in a wheelchair for the, most of her adult life. And so she couldn't come to the shop. The shop was a third story walk up with no elevator. So I would have to bring the, the plates like Gail Singer, I'd have to bring the plates to and from her, her studio. And uh, I published several prints with, with Nell uh, from 1984 to 86. And this was done in 86. But this was a print that was published by the Mezzanine Gallery at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that often published prints with artists and then showed them in the Mezzanine Gallery and sold them to help raise funds to the museum. Uh, we started, as you can see, the first state is on the far left, which is just a line drawing, a very Matisse-like line drawing of the contours of the flowers, the vase of flowers. It's called Gloucester Bouquet. The, the second plate, the second proof is uh, the same plate added with aquatint, but printed in blue, which was the, what, the, the same blue that's going to be printed in the final color three plate aquatint on the far right. And that's the final version of the print that went to the mezzanine gallery. The fun part about this particular project is we started it when Nell was uh, on uh, Cape Ann in that summer of 86. 
and she was moving back in November. We didn't finish it, and the and the Met did didn't want me to be shipping the plates back and forth because they were concerned that they would get damaged or get lost. And so they actually flew me from uh, Boston to New York uh, to transport the plates for Nell to work on so that they wouldn't get lost. And the reason we're able to do that uh, is because I was flying People's Express. And people remember People's Express in the audience, uh, $19 each way from Boston to Newark. And it cost me more for the cab ride from Newark to the Upper West Side to Nell's uh, apartment and uh, studio than it did for me to fly from Boston to, to Newark and back again. It was $38 total. I think my cab ride was $40 uh, each way. So it was, it was a kind of an exciting time and it was, uh, it, the, the print turned out to be lovely print. Apparently it's sold out and, um, uh, and, and it's nice for us to see the, the three states and to have those for the archive. And I, I should mention that Nell Blaine is, is a, a well-known Richmond artist. Well, that's right. She was born in Richmond, yeah. Let's move, move on David, to David Let's move on to David Ortons. David uh, it was a Boston artist. He's, he, he moved from Boston many years ago. Uh, but this is a project that was brought to me by another publisher, my friend Dan Elias, Dan Elias Editions. Um, brought David to me uh, to make these, to make this series of, uh, well, they're actually two series of three. And these are called Spitbite Aquatints. And uh, David was working on a series of drawings at the time, these sort of ink wash drawings on onion skin paper that had really interesting textures and, and this sort of sense of fluidity. And I had to find, that's one of my jobs as a master printer is to try to find a technique within the intaglio uh, media, medium that, that that is a really good translation of their attitude in their primary medium. And so I decided that we would, uh, we would, uh, um, we, we, tr we try spit bite aqua tint with really super, super fine rosin dust. I mean, finer than I normally would use. And uh, to get these really super fluid, uh, almost, you know, uh, seamless aqua tints. And the way David, drew on them was really extraordinary. And if, if we can get close up, David, to the top right one, if we can, that top right one, that's the one that shows this technique the best, I think. There you go. And that's, that's pretty good. So if you get people can see the textures there, but there's really rich values. The, the, the aquatint is super fine. And David is actually not necessarily drawing on the plates, but he's actually pouring the acid directly onto the plate. And he's doing that with various strange vessels. He brought all, like, like Waterford crystal creamers that he inherited from his grandmother and various sizes, uh, eyedroppers and, you know, um, uh, gravy boats and such. And, and he would gently pour the acid onto the surface of the plate and sometimes just to create a big field to start and then rinse it off so it would be a gray tone and then get more and more specific as he went along and I would add, sometimes I would add um, uh, 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 gum Arabic in it to thicken it up so it, it would stay tight and create those really particular uh, sharp, you know, not sharp shapes, but specific shapes on it. But what's more interesting is that he got, a, get, got very creative and, and creative and took some dishwashing liquid, put it in a jar with some water, shook it up and made these florets of, of, of soap suds, which then he would drop on the plate and on the aqua tinted plate and with an eyedropper would drop the acid directly into these little florets of, of bubbles and that the, and the and the soap would help create these incredible textures that uh, on the surface plate that i'd never seen before in in spit bite aqua tin. so he was really uh, really clever really sort of you know pushed the medium out and and uh, i would say to get these six plates we probably did you know 30 plates because the, the aqua tint being so fine would easily burn out. We had to really learn to time it so that we wouldn't burn out the aqua tint. The acid would actually etch underneath it. But in any case, really interesting and fun project uh, outside my own publishing um, activity. And, and again, purely as a master printer, a hired gun by another, by another publisher. All right, who's next? Okay, let's oh, move on we'll to, go to um, Kelly Sherman. To Kelly Sherman. So as we go through this exhibition, you see there's no particular style that you can identify prints from Center Street Studio. Um, 
if the artist's work is really interesting to me, no matter the genre, I'll pursue it and I'll try to come up with a, a, a project within the within a medium that makes really good sense uh, to to pursue. And and Kelly Sherman is a is a Boston-based artist, um, conceptually based, does a, a lot of work with uh, the internet and lists off the internet. But this particular project was a lot of fun. It's called To Move Ours Mine. And it is a list, on the left is a list of all the things that came together when she moved in with her boyfriend at one time. All of their belongings uh, uh, got, got put together. And then she creates this list in no particular order. And then the same plate uh, on the right is all of the things that are left after the, the, the relationship dissolved. Um, she, she ground out, she came, she actually ground out with, a, with a, a Dremel tool, all of his stuff to remove him from that list and remove him from his life. And, and then all the traces of that removal are there on the plate. So it's like erasures. So the, the remaining list uh, is just her stuff. And that's, that's the, 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 it's the, the hours, the, the two moved, they moved in together and the hours is on the left and the mind is on the right. And I just, uh, I just really love that project. Um, and it, there's actually, I, I don't have the, her description of it, probably too long to read, but I, uh, it, it, it would be, I think it's on my website. You can read her, her statement about that project. So, and I invite folks who wanna see these things close up because uh, we can't get that close in this, in this gallery view, especially for works like this, which I invite you to send, go to centerstreetstudio.com and, uh, and you'll be able to get, you know, right up to these things, you can see the actual images and, and actually all the text in this particular one. All right, well, why don't we move on to Cyrus Highsmith. <laughs> Cyrus, I know this is one of the newest projects from the shop and um, Cyrus uh, calls himself a letter drawer. He's actually a, 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 a type designer. He's a protege of Matthew Carter, who is the, one of the greatest type designers alive today. He's responsible for type faces like Verdana and Georgia that most of you know from your computers. <clears throat> but um, Cyrus teaches at RISD uh, type design. And he also does, uh, I met him actually at a dinner for the Society of Printers. Believe it or not, there's such a thing in Boston called the Society of Printers. And we meet once a month at the Club of Odd Volumes for dinner and for lectures. And uh, he sat across from me one night and he was showing me some of these really whimsical drawings that he does that I really liked. And I said, and he told me how much he admired the, the, the Matthew Carter portfolio and how that velvety black that I got of the, the letter forms that are in that portfolio. So I invited him to do a project based on some of his little drawings that he showed me. And he wanted to maximize that velvety black that you get in Intaglio Aquitaine. And so he chose, I think, a really good subject, these black crows. Uh, um, as the images for it, as a suite of them, and they're all different poses. And I, I remarked, and I, I think he, he, he agreed, they reminded me of like letter forms, a good sense of their gestures. And uh, so it was a really fun, sort of whimsical little project uh, that, that has this velvety black, and you maximize the, the, the quality of the aqua tint and the black ink of Italia uh, that, uh, that really made sense for this particular project. I think this is one of the most recent projects that you've. It uh, is, it is. Yeah, I've got a few more on press as we speak, but uh, that's I'd say actually, and I still haven't finished printing the edition of that. That's that's an edition of thirty of each of those, and I've got uh, I've got a little bit more to go. All right, let's move on to George Whitman. George Whitman. George, I call George is, I call him one of my long haulers. He. Uh, I've been working with George since 1998 and George taught at the University of Richmond. He taught drawing there for many, many years. And I met him um, after the first exhibition in 1998, uh, more than one prints and portfolios from the Center Street studio. And um, he, uh, he came to me up after my, my gallery talk and asked me if I would look at some of his drawings and I get solicited by artists all the time. To, to want to make prints with me. And, and, uh, and so I, I, uh, I obliged and because sometimes it's not always that fruitful, but he showed me this little portfolio of drawings and of course they were exquisite and I nearly fainted. They were so beautiful. And I said, well, you must make really beautiful prints. And he says, well, I haven't made prints. And so when I returned back to 
Boston, I, I, uh, I put some hard grounds on some copper plates and I shipped them down to him a little crate and uh, told him to start making, start making prints. And, and uh, it, it, this, the way, and George never stepped foot in the shop. He was able to work on the plates in his own studio by just doing what's called, you know, simple hard ground line and stipple uh, drawing on the plate etching. It's absolutely nothing different than what Rembrandt did uh, uh, 300 years ago, 350 years ago. Um, it's, he draws through the ground, he sends it back to me, and I etch it. And, and I'm always astounded what comes back on those plates, because he never tells me what the subject is going to be. He just, they just sort of arrive unannounced on my doorstep, and I open them up, and I'm always amazed. And you can see on the left is this, this pretty splendid dragonfly with various flora behind it. Um, and it printed with a chine collet, uh, and this is, you know, typical, the level of detail, um, the focus is just astounding. And one of the things I want to talk about with someone that worked with someone like George, and this is all done via FedEx, by the way. So the plates are prepared and then I put them in these crates that suspend the plate inside. So nothing touches the surface of it. And George works on it for like a plate like this could easily be 18 months. And then he puts it back in the crate and sends it to me and it arrives. <clears throat> and then it's my job to etch it and to etch it properly. It's not like, it's not a given. I mean, the, each drawing has its own character and you have to be very careful how to etch it. So it's my responsibility to make sure that I get the, the maximum out of this plate. I don't want to over, I don't want to under etch it and I don't want to over etch it. And so I am hovering over this thing in the acid bath the entire time keeping an eye on it the entire, the entire way. And uh, I believe if I'm, I checked my notes and I think this was in a ferric chloride bath for about an hour and 10 minutes to get the, the maximum quality of the line. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's that kind of responsibility. You know, if I, if I thought about it, I'd probably um, like, I, 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 I'd probably crumble in fear, you know? It's, it's, a, it's an awesome responsibility because, you know, he's got 18 months of his life in this thing and I'm responsible to make sure it etches correctly and, and prints correctly. And, and uh, that's a pretty awesome responsibility, but somehow we get it done. And on the right, we have a suite of relatively new ones. Well, I think it's the project just before the, the, um, the Dragonfly. And these are a series of close-ups of horses' eyes. I didn't know quite what they were when they first arrived. He had to inform me. Um, and uh, they, they are a wonderful study of texture and rhythm, um, somewhere between representation and abstraction. And uh, I think they're pretty amazing. So they work it's, very well as, an, as a suite. Let's move on you know. to Galbert Pedder. Yes, they're, they're, they're meant to be seen as a suite, exactly. All right, so this is, this is an example of one of those strange projects that, uh, that are, it, that, you know, come to my door at step and, and um, are outside my normal publishing activity. So I studied, these are by Gabor Pedderty, um, who I studied with at Yale, and I, I, who I stayed in contact with after he retired in 87. I finished in 84, he retired actually in 87. And uh, he also studied with Stanley William Hader, oddly enough, but he did so in 1930 and I did in 1980. So there's 50 years between our time with Hader. Hader had uh, touched a lot of lives. And so after um, Gabor passed away in 2001, his widow Joan was organizing his archive and she asked me if I would print some plates that she didn't have some proofs of. And she found that some of his more famous plates had images etched on the back of them. And she wanted proofs of that for his archive. And so she asked me if I would do that. Of course, I, I very much wanted to do that. And just the honor of printing one of Gabby's plates. So like for instance, the, the pair that we're looking at now, the one on the left is called Big Tree Two from the 1950s, very well known uh, engraving. And um, it was this really wonderful Hungarian folk uh, image that he had done in his youth. So he kept the copper 
but he must have traveled with it over here to the States and uh, then used it to, to do his, uh, the, 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 the print in the 1950s. So I don't know, we don't know what the year was on the one with the stag on the right, but in any case, it's this wonderful Hungarian folk image. And uh, so because they were print, they were, they were on either side of the plate, uh, I printed the images on either side of the paper. So on the back of the print on the left is an example of the stag on the, on the other side of that paper. And then the one on the right, the stag is the, the tree image on the back of it. And we're able to show both because I had two copies uh, of those prints. So we were able to show each side. Um, and the same thing with the, with the prints on the right. Those are, again, I think the it's, uh, see, I think it's rock and seed is on the right, which is actually a color print, which uses the simultaneous color technique that um, that uh, was developed at Atelier 17. This is just a black and white proof of the plate. And on the back of it was this uh, charming folk image as well. That looks like it had been cropped a little bit. Maybe she cut the plate to accommodate the, the, the size of the, of the new print on the, on the right. So that's, uh, and, and yeah, so that, and, and those will be part of the, even though it's outside of my publishing activity, um, these will be part of the archive at Richmond as well. And it's an interesting way of looking at, at Patterdy's work to, to see what happened uh, many years right. ago. And then not, it, and not all of his plates had prints, uh, you know, had images on the back of them. Just, they just, I think, I think maybe six, I believe. I have to look at the portfolio, but I think there were six different plates that Joan had given me to, um, to print for the archive, for her archive as well. Okay, let, let's move on to the John Walker monotype. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we haven't looked at monotypes yet today. So. That's right. So for those of you uh, who don't know, monotypes are unique prints. They're sort of like paintings that happen to be run through the press. <laughs> and in this, particular instance, John Walker, the British painter. Um, this print went to the press probably about 12, 15 times before, um, before it was finished. And the, um, it was from a series of imagery um, that were based on his memories of World War I as he had um, from stories that his father told him. His father was a World War I soldier and he would tell him stories of the horror of the battles that and I believe he fought in the Battle of the Summit, if I'm not mistaken, the father. In any case, John was doing a series of paintings based on those memories and you can see these sort of uh, red crosses and uh, that, that suggest the battlefield uh, cemeteries that you see throughout Europe. And this text scrawled across it and, um, and the text actually is from a very famous poem called In Parenthesis by David John. Jones, a British, uh, and who was also fought in World War I. And uh, it's an epic poem, it's quite long, but in any case, John was using one particular phrase you know, from the poem that was pretty powerful that throughout all his paintings and these prints. And I, I can recite it. It says, uh, men went to Catrice as day dawned, their fears disturbed their peace. And um, that it's just this, you know, this layering, this sort of dense layering of both text and image that John was doing at the time. And, and monotype seemed to be the best, uh, the best method of, of getting that across. That's a goodly sized print. I think that's 40 by 30, if I'm not saying, maybe 48 by 36 is actually, I think, the size of it. Um, so they're like big paintings on paper. But for John's a very really powerful painter. He's, uh, I, he's a very dear friend, and we've made lots of prints together. But I'm glad this one is in the, is in the archive. No, it's, it's good. And we have another set of uh, monotypes for another poem by John Walker. So, uh, right. Nice to have him. I think that was a Wilfred Owen poem. It's another British soldier. So why don't we move, move along to the Rembrandt? Okay, let's move on to, let, yeah, let's move along to Rembrandt. These are actually two, these are two projects that uh, came, that landed on my doorstep two different uh, times. And again, outside my normal uh, publishing activity, but really fun to be involved in. And, and the, the, so the print on the left is an actual Rembrandt print, printed by me from the original plate. Now, 
Rembrandt's plates, many of them exist, still exist. They're, they're in collections throughout the world and they were held actually, and you know, after Rembrandt's life, they were, you know, they were sort of passed around and sold and, and often went to the hands of French publishers who printed them uh, and forever and then wore them out pretty well. Um, this plate of this reclining male nude uh, was purchased <coughs> at auction by Marty Peretz, who was the, the publisher of the New Republic magazine back then. And he wanted to print it as corporate gifts to give away. And uh, he was told by every curator, he asked who, he was asking who should print it. And they all said, don't print it. It's an artifact, please don't print it. And he wanted to print it anyway. And so the, the um, Sinclair Hitchings, the keeper of drawings, of prints, drawings and photographs at the Boston Public Library said, oh, so print, go, to, go to Jim Stroud, he'll print it for you. And of course, you know, I can understand the curator's concern, but we had it steel face, so it wouldn't be, it wouldn't wear any further. And just the opportunity to print a Rembrandt plate was just too much for me to pass up. So I agreed to do it. I think he wanted 60 of them. And I printed the edition as I, <clears throat> as I was supposed to do, but I noticed on the back of the plate, um, Rembrandt, in order to protect it from the acid, had painted the hard ground on the back as well, but he didn't do such a great job that all the brush strokes covered all the copper. So when he put it in the acid to etch the image in the front, the acid attacked in the little parts of the brush strokes that he left uh, uncovered. And I realized that those were Rembrandt's uh, brush strokes. And I thought that was really interesting. So I decided I wanted to see what I wanted to look like. So I, I printed it and it was kind of, it was really interesting. So I printed both the front and the back of the plate on the same sheet and um, that was the day before Marty was coming to pick up the edition. And of course, I didn't sleep well that night because I thought, you know, I didn't really ask permission to do that. And even though I protected the front of the plate when I ran it through the press, I was concerned that he might think that I took advantage of the situation. So I, of course, I was going to tell him about it. So he comes and I show him the edition. He was very pleased. And then I said, I have confession. I, I printed the back of the plate as well. And that's probably the first time the back of a Rembrandt plate has ever been printed. And he was ecstatic and said, can I have it? And I said, yeah, if I, I can have this one because I'd actually printed two. And so he gave me that second, uh, that he gave me the second copy of it. And there it is, the front and back of a, a Rembrandt plate probably never seen before. So the fun project. And, it, it and makes, on the right. It makes a beautiful image, yes. David, there we go. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a nice image. It's really quite worn too. I have to say, the to pr get the image to print, <laughs> like I said, his plates, Rembrandt's plates have been printed by pretty much everybody who owned them most since for the last three hundred fifty years, and so the, they do get worn. I think you know that steel facing has been around. I think since the nineteenth century. So on the back of the plate, there are a couple of uh, worn spots. You can see is probably where they applied the the, um, the cathode to 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 steel face it. So where it's soldered and and so you can see three places where it was where it was soldered to to apply the steel facing but in any case the plate did get worn and the the museum of fine arts in boston owns a lifetime impression of that print and marty gifted them print that and ordinary this this mine has a sort of silvery almost like a graphite pencil uh, effect whereas the the lifetime impression is quite rich and dark, much much darker than, than that one. I had to print it with a great deal of pressure in order to get those lines to come up and finesse the white paper. But that's all technical stuff. It's too boring for here. Um, on the right is a re-engraving of Paul Revere's famous uh, Boston Massacre print plate. Um, this was done in 1832 by the Boston Facsimile Company. It was actually hand engraved, faithfully hand engraved by someone, a gentleman by the name of John Stanton. And um, it, it was a commemorative print that was you know, printed in addition to sell uh, with the full text included underneath it. And it was, I believe it was also hand colored because I think there's still some of the original ones from 1832 kicking around in various collections. <laughs> uh, the original Paul Revere plate does not have the full text on it anymore. I actually saw it because I was supposed to print it at one point for the Massachusetts archives. But um, Paul Revere cut the plate uh, at the bottom and removed about half the text only because to accommodate the back 
uh, the images that he gave, engraved in the back, he actually was, was um, commissioned to engrave promissory notes for the Revolutionary Army. So he had engraved three bills on the back of the, of the, the, the Boston Massacre plate and then cut the bottom to, to, to take off the extra because I guess the bills had to be a certain dimension. And so he printed uh, the bills for the, you know, to pay the troops, uh, the Continental Congress paying the, the, the troops. So the original plate only has half the text. This has the full text re-engraved in 1832. As I said, it's owned, it was owned by the uh, American Antiquarian Society in Worcester. And it came to me by, uh, uh, through a gentleman named Mr. Goodspeed of Goodspeed Books and Prints uh, on, on Beacon Hill in Boston, now long gone. Uh, and uh, he was sort of a facilitator to, to and so I, I printed 150 of these things and they sent the, the entire edition off to a hand colorist to, to faithfully hand color it based on Paul Revere's original print. Uh, and I received five proofs as partial payment for the project. So this is the last one that I have printed on, I believe uh, early 19th century, if not late uh, 18th century paper. I remember the soaking it, it smelled pretty bad because it, I believe the sizing was like animal sizing. So it had a rather distinct pungent uh, aroma. Let me see if it makes a good facsimile. Why don't we move move on to, to Charlie Ritchie? As I said, Charlie Ritchie, another one of my long haulers. And like George Whitman, we do most of our work together via FedEx. Um, these are mesotints. Uh, I prepare, or Charlie prepares, we are sending prepared mesotinted plates, which are ready for him to work on directly, and I ship them FedEx to him. And he, in, in, in mesotint, it's a, a textured plate that if I printed it when we started, it would be a solid black. And the artist's job is to scrape and burnish the image down to pull out the, uh, so you're going from dark to light. So the more you scrape and burnish the, the metal surface down, the lighter the, tone, the resultant tone. And these are three landscapes, very hard to see. They're on the website if you care to go visit. Um, and we, Charlie and I have been working this way since 1994. Uh, pretty much, I would say 90% of our, our projects are done. Uh, and I believe he's listening in, maybe not 90%, Charlie, 85%. He did come to the shop to do a portfolio by Aquatin and then Two Houses Day, Two Houses Night, all of which are on the website. But for the most part, these are all done by shipping the plates back and forth via FedEx. I would proof them, send them back with the proof. He'd work on them, send them back. I would proof it again, send it back, back and forth many times before he uh, resolves the image. Um, yeah. Should so we've been working together since 1994. Yeah. What's that? All right. Should we move on to Lester Johnson? Yeah, we'll move. That'll be our last artist before. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're getting close here. So I think our timing is good. This is, um, it's, it's fun to, to end with Lester Johnson because he was the actually, the, the, he was the first artist I ever published. I actually studied with Lester uh, at Yale as well. I met my wife in his figure drawing class. So we're very fond of Lester. I was very pleased to offer <laughs> my first publishing gig with him. And he was very happy to do it. This is not the first print that we published together. Um, that one was called Arabesque in 1984. Uh, it's also in the collection, but we've shown it in the past. I'm thinking the first show. So um, this just just came to the down to Richmond in the archive. This in this last group. So I thought it would be fun to 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 show because um, it really you know he was the very first artist that I published. And, um, and this is color aqua edition of 40, which I delivered down. To, again, he didn't come to the shop. It's, I actually, before, I wasn't using FedEx back then. I would actually slip down to his studio in Greenwich, Connecticut with the plates, usually on my way to New York to, if I was doing business or visiting family or such. And I would drop the plates off. He would work on them in the weekend. I would pick them up on Sunday or Monday, bring them back to the shop, process them, pull the proof, send it down to him. My next trip down, bring the plates. Again, you work it that way. So and eventually when the edition was done, I dropped it off at his home in Greenwich in, on Friday for him to sign. And then I went off to New York. I came back and discovered that he had hand colored every single print in the edition with gouache. I don't know if you can look, but if you get a little closer look, David, yeah, there you go. You see some dark uh, marks uh, over the eyes and also some 
color in the beads in the hand on the right that she's holding, and those are all sort of hand colored gouache. <laughs> Pleasant surprise. But uh, so then the, um, yeah, so the, so the first artist is the last we get to talk about, but he was uh, very dear. He, he passed away a bunch of years ago as well. Great guy. So that's all I have to say at the moment. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Jim, for sharing your insights. And uh, now uh, we have time with Heather for, for a few questions from the Q&A. You're mute. Okay, sorry about that. Um, let's see. So I just wanted to remind our audience that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And um, okay, so right now we have one question. Um, Jim, what has been your favorite print or your favorite artist to work with? Ha. That's 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 a tough question, but um, and I don't think I hurt any of my artist's feelings, but actually this print right behind me and my over my shoulder, the Martin Luther King portrait by John Wilson is uh, one of my favorite prints. I would say my favorite print, but he was certainly one of my favorite artists to work with. Really powerful painter, sculptor, and um, that this print uh, came, he, so John, John is the sculptor of the bronze portrait of Martin Luther King that stands in the uh, rotunda of the Capitol building in Washington. And yeah, there was a study, a drawing study of that, um, that uh, got uh, curated into an exhibition called In the Spirit of Martin that was sponsored by the, by the Smithsonian uh, Institute. Uh, uh, gosh, so many years ago, I can't remember. It was a traveling exhibition. And and the Yemen of Boston owned drawing and they only loaned it out for the first three months of the of the exhibition schedule. And so they were going to take it back. And John was was distraught because they, they, they he wanted it in the show and it was used for the for the catalog and for all the advertising. And so I invited John to come back to the studio and make an etching version of it so that we can replace the drawing with the etching. And it, it, it's a really powerful portrait of King. And it was a real struggle for John to get it to happen because the both the, 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 the drawing, it was a real challenge for me as a master printer because <clears throat> the, the, uh, the, the, the character of the drawing and the likeness had to come together at the same time. And it was elusive. It just never, they never came together until about a month into the <clears throat> making of the project, a making of the print. And uh, it took something like 18 states of the plate to get to the final version of it. And I invite everyone to go to the website, see it close up. But it's, it's I, think, I think it's one of the most important prints to come out of my shop in, in the 37 years that I've been um, uh, publishing prints. Okay. Um, Holly asks if we have any Robert Park Harrisons in the archive. And I actually know the answer to that one is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I think you have seven, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we, we collaborated together. And those were actually interesting. Those are, again, those were all um, third party publishers. There's a first suite. If you go to the website, Holly, you can see the first suite called the Exhausted, uh, the Exhausted Globe Suite that was published by uh, Richard Levy in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Really, a really great guy, a terrific gallerist, good friend. And he made me to do the project. <laughs> with uh, with Robert and um, Lothar Osterberg was the plate maker on those because photogravure is a very specific um, technique you know and I'm not set up for it here I can do it but I'm not fully set up for it and I, I hired it out to Lothar Osterberg who's really talented um, a gravure plate maker and then I uh, then I collaborated with second plates and the we, I think they have, uh, I think they're all got with beeswax. And then there was a second, it was a second suite that was published by Richard and Bonnie Ben Ruby of Bonnie Ben Ruby Gallery's second suite. And I was the master printer on those as well. So that, so the university uh, owns um, all seven of the prints that I've done with the uh, Park Harrison's. Yeah. Really it's great. Also, it's also a good example of the range of 
of showing different techniques to uh, to our faculty and students and and people that visit us. Uh, they had the yeah, the, even your, just even yeah. within the entire technique. I mean, I don't do lith <clears throat> I don't do lithography, and I don't do silk screen. Um, so I'm I'm focused mainly. Uh, an intaglio and woodcut is not set up for lithography. I mean, I've done lithography. I actually have made lith lithographs of my own at the more the great Morlo workshop where Picasso made his lithographs in Paris. But uh, I don't pursue litho as part of my publishing activity. And no digital prints. <laughs> so our answer. next question is a good one. Out of the works on view, which one was the most challenging? To work with. Oh, interesting. Let's see. The most challenging. I would say. Um, I'm gonna technically. Oh, uh, you know, it's that, that that's answered in many ways. So, uh, challenging in terms of dealing with the artist. I would say the David Ortons. He's he he is a very a very talented artist. I like him very much, but he's very picky, and it was <clears throat> very hard to find. A technique that he was satisfied in in pursuing <laughs> and when we finally did uh he made like i said we made something like 20 plates or 30 plates and from those there were many that were viable but he would just toss them out so it, it and it just they weren't it, it was it he just discarded them they weren't going to get printed and the six he finally chose were printed and were published by dan elias so he's it uh, he was the most challenging in terms of personalities um Technically, uh, I think the physically challenging would be the, the John Walker because when John Walker works in the studio, he takes over the entire place and every surface is covered with ink and with paper and, and I have to keep track of them. And he, he's, like, he's like a whirlwind in the shop. And so, uh, and we work 12, 14 hours uh, and, and I'm just grinding. And unfortunately at the time at that project, I had a studio assistant. So we were, and I had a really large studio at a 3,600 square foot studio, downtown Boston. So, and we would work, you know, 12, 14 hours straight into the night and, and I'd be exhausted by the end of it, but you at always pleased with the end results, you know, and he'd work for a solid week, come up and uh, just grind for 12, 14 hours a day. So physically that, and I think I'm trying to think technically, um, difficult. No, there weren't that many in this particular show that I think were, were particularly technically hard. So I'll pass on that. Okay, fair Everything enough. Was in my wheel, within my wheelhouse. Okay, so the next question is about what is your hope for the collection as it lives uh, here in Richmond? Um, what is something that you would like future students to know or how would you like for them to be able to engage with the collection? Oh, that's really, that's such a great question. And that's the reason why I was so pleased that Richard um, uh, committed to, to uh, bringing it down to Richmond because, you know, there were some uh, co other collections interested in, in it and in closer to home here in Boston, but um, whether or not the collection would ever get seen or used uh, or studied was a real concern of mine. You know, I just can see it as one particular institution will go unnamed it, that my that my life's work would be in the bowels of that institution, barely cataloged and unknown, you know. And I, I just couldn't bring myself, even though it was it would be part of Boston legacy. It just wasn't going to get seen. And and you know, with the museum studies program down there in Richmond and people, this this collection is get studied. It's going to get used. It's going to and Richard already uses it and, and, and presents it throughout the entire university. Uh, you know, I can't, every time I call down, I, I ask about a certain print, he goes, oh, that's out at such and such at the law school, or that's out at you know, the business school. It is being seen and used at all times. And to have your life's work uh, and my artist's work appreciated to that level, and, and that can go on in perpetuity. I mean, the, the archive doesn't stop at any time. So Center Street, as long as Center Street Studio keeps going, the archive continues to go down, everyone. And we, we should explain that the archive, uh, not, it, it consists mostly of what's called the BAT, the bon uh, the French term good to pull. Uh, they Americanized it here as okay to print, OKTP. 
<laughs> and that is the print that I pull off the plate and the artist says, this is what I want the edition to look like, both technically and aesthetically, this is your guide. And, and it gets signed as such, it becomes the pr property of the printer or in my case, the printer and the publisher and, and off I go. And so I've committed every single BAT since 1984 and even beyond on that um, to, as well as examples of the monotype projects, as well as state proofs, trial proofs, uh, everything that, you know, all the stuff that builds up to the final, to the final print gets included in, in the collection. And it's going to be a really rich resource for students who, for, for generations. I can't ask for more than that. Right. Okay, we have one more question. And it is from Tom from Cleveland. And uh, uh, Tom asks I, a question that I actually uh, wanted to ask myself. So uh, he asks, Jim, how often are there serious disagreements about printing techniques between you as the master printer and the artist? Give us the I, I know who I know who this Tom is. I know he's, I know that I get that question coming from him. None, there's never any disagreements because most so here's the thing. I don't work with the printmakers, I work with painters. Sculptors and a lot of them, don't. <laughs> and uh, I just point them in the direction. I mean, this is what I do. I mean, I, I look at their, I invite them because I see their work. I can see the gears when I look at their work in exhibition, and the gears start turning in my head as to how the best way that we can translate their image, their issues, uh, and images from their primary medium into a print medium that I know so well. I invite them to do it, and I point them in the direction. I develop what I consider uh, sort of technical strategies that will get us to a place where we can make a meaningful print. We're not here to make reproductions or, or print translations or, uh, of their images and painting. We are here to make a new image inspired by their issues in their painting or their sculpture through a medium that, is, that informs it. And the artists, I would say all of the artists have, tr uh, are, have trusted me in pointing them in that direction. And this, Rarely a disagreement, um, if, if at all. I mean, it just it hasn't happened. And any disagreements yet? No, no, no. Nothing's. We've never come to fisticuffs. If that, that's what Tom is asking. Okay, Jim. Just want to thank you once again for this. Has been really terrific to uh, have us all walk through the exhibition with you. And I want to thank you and and all of our. Uh, attendees that, that came to join us today. Uh, we thank you.